this Zoom replay was originally streamed summer 2020 and is brought to you in part to the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. Menla membership community. Okay, I'm just opening it on the side. All right. It's great to see you, Sharon. You're in Barry, of course, right? I'm in Barry, Mass. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Great. And how is Joseph and everybody there? Joseph's fabulous. Jo the room I'm in now used to be a screened-in porch. I and see. I made it into an office. And on his side of the house, it's still a screened-in porch. So that's the epicenter of my social life. It's I the see. only place I ever see anybody. Oh, uh, good. Well, that's the way. <laughs> so, so we just good. had lunch yesterday. Right. Good. That's good. Well, give him my best wishes. I will, for sure. Mr. For Mr. Sure. Mr. One Dharma. He really, uh, he, he used to not feel good teaching online now he loves it he doesn't have to travel anywhere he's like, that's right it's really that is a mixed blessing coming from the covid thing it makes you feel a little guilty that it's kind of nice actually but of course people are dropping dead right and left so that's not nice yeah. absolutely uh, absolutely but uh that's really good so uh and what else is going on? So you don't have any booking, any trips booked or anything, Cheryl, right? I'm getting the, I'm getting the note to start, Kenzie. I'm not. Oh, too great. Well, just hang in. Whoops. My train just went dark. Why is that? Uh, because I'm going to welcome you. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, afternoon, morning, everybody. Wherever you might be joining us from today on our small interrelated planet. I am Menla's co-director, Michael Burbank, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this special Tibet House U.S. Menla online conversation with Sharon Salzberg and Tenzing Bob Thurman. Tibet House U.S. is the Dalai Lama's cultural center and Tibetan embassy in New York City, and Menla is our Catskills nature resort and healing spa. Our mission is to preserve and present Tibetan culture in exile from its medicine and healing traditions to its many yogas, meditations, and rituals, from its music and breathtaking art to its profound psychological and philosophical literature. Our motto is love Tibet, and we welcome <laughs> you to fall in love with Tibet with us, if you haven't already, and help us to preserve this precious and endangered Buddhist culture, which has suffered ethnogenocidal oppression for over 60 years and which has so much to offer us and to the rest of the world. Tonight, Tenzing welcomes special guest and dear multi-lifetime friend, Sharon Salzberg, on the topic of her newly released book, Real Change, Mindfulness to Heal Ourselves and Our World. After Sharon and Tenzing offer their opening remarks, we'll be taking your questions for Sharon about her book via the, the Zoom Q&A function. You can input your questions directly into the Q&A window, which can be found below the video stream next to chat and the audio and video options. For those on mobile devices or using an older version of the Zoom client, you can, you can input your questions directly into the chat window. Please format your questions as succinctly as possible and always end with a question mark so that they are seen as questions by the Zoom system. These questions will be read aloud by our moderator, Michelle Lowe, and Tenzing Bob as time allows. This online dialogue is being recorded and simulcasted on the Tibet House US Menla YouTube channel. To learn more, please visit the link under the recording notice at the top right of the screen. This broadcast will be available as an episode of the Bob Thurman podcast on iTunes and your favorite listening platforms. To learn more about Sharon's new book and her virtual book tour, please visit her website at SharonSalzberg.com. We will also provide direct links at the end of the session through the Zoom chat and with the high definition replay videos that we will send you via email after, the, uh, after this program. We hope you will learn a lot from this presentation and will find renewed inspiration deeper wisdom, and extra energy to meet life's many challenges together. A big thank you to Sharon and to Tenzing Bob 
for sharing your wisdom with us today. We're so grateful for your tireless and selfless work on behalf of us all. And with that, I'll pass the virtual microphone to Tenzin Bob. Okay, thank you, Michael. And uh, welcome, Sharon. I'm so happy to see you here with us. And um, I didn't, I, initially, this was to be a podcast on your book, and it's gotten these larger dimensions, and that's also good. It'd be available everywhere. After all, it's impossible in the time of COVID to do the normal book tour that you have often, so often done in other books. And uh, tirelessly presenting your excellent healing ideas to the wide public of all levels and in all situations in the United States. Now, I don't think anyone is here who doesn't know who you are and how wonderful you are. And I only want to say that um, Sharon, from the beginning of when the Tibet House uh, was given the Menla Mountain Retreat, as we used to call it, um, which was part of our mission of preserving Tibetan culture, in the sense of trying to highlight the Tibetan healing traditions, uh, which are show kind of in sort of the, the, where the rubber is hitting the road of people being ill, people not feeling well, and so on, showing the value of Tibetan culture. Uh, they're sort of they're sort of because the culture's healing tradition, its medical, its healthcare system shows everything about a culture, how together it is or not together it is. And uh, I, I won't mention the implications of that for the moment, <laughs> but that's the case. And so of all the Dharma friends of mine and people that I know, Sharon has been a wonderful contributor to the programs at Tibet House and at Menla and has been a staunch uh, supporter with us. She also loves the Dalai Lama. He loves her. And um, he, she really represents uh, just a, a very great kindness, you know, in the Dalai Lama's idea that his, he has the common human religion of kindness. I think Sharon very much exemplifies that in her life and in her writings. So with that introduction, Sharon, I turn it over to you. And I, I um, according to your wishes, you're going to lead us in a short meditation before I ask you a few questions and you maybe read for us some passages maybe in the book and you talk about the book, and um, we proceed on that. But first, a meditation from Sharon, a meditation master, Sharon. Great Sharon. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's, okay. it's so awesome to see you and be yeah. with you. And virtual space is such an odd thing, because now I'm really missing Menla as a physical location uh, and Tibet house, but... Um, here we are, you know, and, and yes. uh, what a triumph, really, that we managed to be together, and it feels so close and I, I know. and wonderful. That so is great. That is great. Um, it's great. So um, I'm I'm really uh, so delighted to be here. If I were on a, a physical book tour, I don't want to say real book tour because this is real, just different. If I were on a <laughs> physical book tour, it would certainly be a Tibet house one night or another oh, sure, instead sure. i'm in massachusetts and uh here <laughs> and uh you know as some of you who've, who've tuned into anything that i've taught lately know that i i came up here march 14th thinking it was for a few weeks i was in new york city and just feeling uneasy and i thought well i have a house in massachusetts i have a retreat center of course which is now closed the insight meditation society and uh, I came up here with my snow boots, thinking I'd be here for two weeks, and I'm still here. Um, <laughs> but such is life, you know. Are you, are you actually closed? You, I didn't realize the center. That. Yeah, we're closed. We, oh, really? we, oh, really? we closed even before the order came to oh, to I close see. down, and it's complicated, you know. Um, it's complicated. Estamos cerrados ahora. Oh, hello, Sebastian. How are you? Uh, <laughs> are you translating into Spanish, Sebastian? I think that was, a, 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 I think that's our friend Sebastian. Hello, oh, Sebastian. Thank you for translating. Yeah, um, I think he's translating into Spanish. Like, very that was nice. one of the things, you know, I read uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, this is all before I lead a sitting, but in the beginning of the pandemic, I had read somebody's comment um, 
I always thought if I only had the time, I would really clean my house thoroughly. Turned out that wasn't the problem, you know, <laughs> so that fell by the wayside as well as I was determined I was going to learn Spanish in this time, and that has not happened either. Uh, but I have connected a lot with people as good. as best I can, so, so that's really great. And I thought it would be good if we could start with uh, even a short meditation, just sure. very much that sense of gathering our energy and something that I am really, uh, really looking at a lot these days and talking about a lot these days, which is the quality of rest. Just resting our attention, not trying to block the maelstrom of thinking and feeling and everything that may be going on, but having some space, having a place of rest. And so uh, many techniques will do that differently. The way I was taught, of course, uh, very much use something like just the feeling of the breath, the natural feeling of the in and out breath, the natural sensations of the in and out breath as a place to rest. It's something we don't need to manipulate or contrive. We can simply be with. And if the breath doesn't work for you, then it could be something else already happening, another sensation in your body or listening to sound. But I'll guide it as though it were the breath. So you can sit comfortably, close your eyes or not, however you feel most at ease. You can start actually by listening to sound, whether it's the sound of my voice or other sounds. It's a way of relaxing deep inside, allowing our experience to come and go. And of course we like certain sounds and we don't like others but you can just have the sounds wash through you. And bring your attention to the feeling of your body sitting, whatever sensations you discover. You can feel the earth supporting you. You can feel space touching you. And then bring your attention to the feeling of your breath, just the normal natural breath wherever you feel it most distinctly, like the nostrils or the chest or the abdomen. And the operative word is rest. See if you can feel just one breath. You don't have to look back at what's already gone by. You don't have to lean forward for even the very next breath. Just this one. And let the breath come to you. you find your attention wandering, you get lost in thought, spun out in fantasy, or you fall asleep, truly don't worry about it. We say the next moment is the critical moment when we have the chance to be really different. So instead of judging yourself or blaming yourself, you realize you've been distracted, see if you can let go gently and simply return your attention to the feeling of the breath. We let go and we begin again.
And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes or lift your gaze and we'll end the session. Oh, thank you for that. I always like to gather and <laughs> more fully arrive. Oh, that's great. A rest is so good. Rest. Deep rest. Well, don't you find that people are generally speaking kind of exhausted? Absolutely. They really are. It's just uh it's um, it's part of this time, especially people like the many people in your book who are really trying to do something about this, the pain and suffering that is going on all around us. And it's, it's such, it seems so huge to everyone. And they feel so gripped by doing it. And um, then they never can do enough, as you, as you point out. And um, that's what I love about the book. I think really it's your best book yet. Really, I really Thank think you. so. Sarah. It really Thank is. You. It's wonderful. It's like, you know, it made me think what I thought of that I hadn't thought of in relation to the book until that moment of rest. I thought of the power, peacemaking, the power of nonviolence conference in, uh, in uh, San Francisco in 1997, where you were present. And um, where there was a collection, it was a, it was a conference with the Dalai Lama and um, uh, Jose Ramos Horta and um, uh, the lady from Guatemala, the other noblest from Guatemala, her sister actually, and then lots of other activists from all over the country. And you and Joseph and uh, I think Joseph was also there and Jack and all Jack, the yeah. all the meditation coaches, also Zen coaches and other kinds, they were doing this great service of joining all the different activist meetings and trying to introduce into the into the sort of atmosphere of the of the activists this notion of sort of inner peace and inner calm and inner self care to try to help them with burnout and so forth. And all of you already by that time were, were sort of big stars in your, in, your, in your own right, in the Dharma world at least and, and, and more. And yet you, you were there serving the activists in this selfless and wonderful way. I really remember that. And I just thought of it now in relation to the book where you're bringing along uh, the, this new generation, uh, maybe a few from the old time, but kind of new generations of activists and you've so much gotten to know so many of them, many that I don't, I, I don't know. And, and you are learning from them while teaching them. And so you're, you, you are like a whole movement really in the book. <laughs> you're like a whole movement. And yet you're, you're making the movement practical and sustainable. And I think that's really wonderful. I really do. I, I was surprised when I first read it, it was so much, bringing others with you, you know, and then yeah, I, at that yeah. time, I know I thought of the Hillary's book, It Takes a Village, you know, you, yeah, you, you, yeah. the book is a village of a lot of creative and wonderful people, and you're serving them by helping them bring along their heart, you know, in a way, and nurturing and nourishing their heart. I think it's really wonderful. Meanwhile, also, like any great teacher, you are learning from them and, and sharing what you learn with us, and it's, it's outstanding, really. So, oh, so you. how did so? So, I'm not saying you started on it at that conference. You've been so activist before that and after that. So, how, what was your motive in the book? It was sort of the open leading question that I thought. Yeah. What What are you trying to accomplish? And what? How How did it come out for you? And where is it going? And all of that. You know? Let it please. Share That's with great. Us. Thank you. Well, I, first, I want to say I think that was the best conference I have ever been to. Uh, yeah. After a lifetime of going to a conference, as I will say, yeah, I, I exactly. think it was actually the best one. It was ever. amazing. It really it was, was amazing. It really was. And I mean, you couldn't have, you know, I mean, you obviously planned it because you worked so hard to create it and, and keep it organized. But 
there were just moments there that were they just happened. They were so extraordinary. They really were. And and uh, I remember so many different things, like um, being backstage and walking by uh, Alice Walker, who was just having a conversation with some people, and and I overheard her say, uh, as I get older, the thing that matters to me more than anything is goodness. It's good-heartedness. Oh, yeah. And I walked on by, and it's been like such an important message, you know, for me. Yeah. yeah. I get older. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I was just like casually overhearing something backstage. And, <laughs> and at one point, there were a number of gang members there. And uh, at one point, they were standing in the aisles. And I remember uh, whoever had, you know, brought them and was sort of organizing that said, I want you to raise your hand if you know someone who's been killed by gun violence. And all these hands went up. Oh. And you know, and this was before in America we sort of got used to, you know, well, if you go to the movies, if you go to church, if you go, you know, school, yes. that might happen to you. But it was like it was so amazing to see the world that had been created with mm-hmm. with violence. Um so and that they were coming through the other side. Mm-hmm. You know, was just the most amazing thing. And of course his holiness the Dalai Lama it was uh, almost took the role of a uh, supreme student, you know, yeah, sure. and, and, you know, was was learning and absorbing. It was an amazing, amazing conference. <laughs> I, I, do you remember the moment of Jean? That I do. I was on the stage with that. You were on stage that time too? Yeah. And Jean Shinoda Bolin, and then when His Holiness addressed the, the youth, and he was waxing really intense and eloquent about how we older generation have done what we've done and it's up to you guys and you're so valuable what you can do and you know you have such a wonderful uh, life ahead of you and you know he was encouraging them in many ways and we really depend on the youth and all something and then there was a pause a lull and Jean Shinoda Bolin popped up and she said I think I was moderating actually and she said uh she held up her hand and I said, uh, well, Jean, what, what, what would you like to say? And she said, well, she said, I really agree everything His Holiness has said and these young people are so inspiring and so on. She said, but there may be one source of energy in dealing with the problem that His Holiness may not have mentioned. <laughs> and I said, and then His Holiness looked, on, or looked over at her, you know, on his, to his right, I remember. And then, and then we said, I said, I think I said, what is that? You know? And she said, menopausal zest. <laughs> and, uh, San Francisco, 4,000 people completely brought the house down. You know, and his host was like, he didn't know the word, you know, and he's like talking to Jimba, I think. Like, what, what, what was that? What is that? He was laughing because he thought it was great because everybody thought it was great, but he didn't know what it was. And then I think it took a minute. <laughs> To sink in, and I still don't think he was sure, but it was explained to him later. <laughs> yeah, well, the translation is an interesting job. <laughs> it is, it is. Many times. It really is. <laughs> so I really thank you for that conference. It stayed with me for all these years. It was very important. And yeah, yeah, I mean, well, I think, I, you know, I had a lot of different motives in trying to think about writing this book. Um, one was I realized I've done a lot of work lately uh, with caregivers, Mm-hmm. You know, first uh, domestic violence shelter workers, then international humanitarian aid workers. And these days, a lot of frontline medical personnel. And mm-hmm. uh, the things that they go through reminds me so much of what activists go through, really being mm-hmm. on the front lines of suffering and mm-hmm. dealing with a system that can seem intractable and needing mm-hmm. to find some balance and burning out and, mm-hmm. you know, the grief and so many things. And mm-hmm. so that was part of what motivated me. And part of it was like my world of, um, you know, uh, meditation people, you know, I've been mm-hmm. teaching now since 1974. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I just know so many people for whom, practicing some form of meditation really opens their hearts and they feel mm-hmm. a, a different kind of compassion, but they also may not feel they can do much, you know, mm-hmm. that whatever they can contribute is so insufficient or so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. little or, or whatever. And mm-hmm. um, 
you know, and, and uh, the example I keep using, because I've seen it so many times, is somebody, and so many people have come to me and said, as an example, I, was, I started meditating and then I was taking a walk on the street and this person came up to me and asked me for a dollar and I gave them a dollar because that's my, my habit. And mm -hmm. it's the first time I ever looked this person in the eye and realized it was a human being. Mm -hmm. You know, I've heard that over and over and over again, but what that person doesn't necessarily then do is think, well, what's the housing policy in the city that so mm -hmm. many people are on the street? You know, mm -hmm. we're not necessarily mm -hmm. trained to look for causes and conditions in that realm, mm -hmm. the way we might be in an internal um, exploration. And so mm -hmm. uh, I've known so many meditators who want to contribute something or make some kind of difference. Mm hmm and uh, they don't feel they have the, the agency or, mm -hmm. or something. So I wanted to address that as well. And then I think the third thing, which became really important to me, was born out of this conversation I had um, with Bell Hooks, and who's an iconic feminist writer and mm -hmm. friend of mine. And she was telling me, um, actually, whenever I describe Bell, I usually say I'm used to the I'm used to Buddhist scholars like parsing a word and like picking it apart and getting precise. <laughs> and, and she's even worse, uh, which is why I think she's such a good writer. And, and she said to me, I don't really like the term social action much because I think it makes you feel like you have to march. You have to protest. That's the only expression. She said, what about art? Uh -huh. You know, what about creativity that dissolves boundaries and breaks through? Uh -huh. You like others, another sense of possibility, you know, so I'm looking at that absolutely gorgeous painting behind you, you know, in that light. And, uh -huh. and so that became an important thing for me to try to include in the book as well. It was just mm -hmm. the notion of creative endeavor as mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. that brings about social change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I think it, it very much comes through. And, and, and you're, you know, His Holiness has that slogan, uh, which is, I mean, it means heartfelt, you know, world peace through inner peace. You know, he always says, you know. And I think you you are presenting a very useful, inspirational uh, guidebook on that, along that line. How to keep the balance? I think you you know you very focus on equanimity. Toward the end, I, that's when I, I was a little late joining the, the the online because I I was caught up reading toward the end, you know. And your focus on balance and equanimity, I think it's so valuable. Do is there a passage or something you'd like to read from the book? Uh, that, I don't, uh, you know, I didn't I didn't prepare anything like that, so I don't really know. But I'll tell you a story. Okay. About okay. the book, and then I'll okay. think if something else comes to mind. Okay, okay. Um, you know, I did include uh, a lot of other people in the book in the sense of, you know, they were interviewed. I have quotes from them. I have their yeah, stories. Oh, that's what's awesome about you know, it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And some of the people um, were people from, this is about equanimity, some of the people were people from the Parkland community. Mm -hmm. uh where of course there was a school shooting and uh, 17 people died and were killed. And um, I went there a few years ago, not too much after the, the shooting and I taught and there was a young woman there, um, Samantha, who's in the book and uh, uh -huh. who I just interviewed the other yes. day for something. And um her mother was a teacher at the school. She was there that day. She she was safe, but it was hours and hours and hours before they knew. And, mm -hmm. and Samantha being very involved in the community in general, got very involved in like organizing marches uh, and, uh -huh. you know, and things like that. And so when I was down there teaching the first time, uh, she raised her hand and she said, you know, I feel really weird because this is like an, an amazing experience. It's like such an incredible thing to be here. And I know the only reason it happened was because that horrible thing happened. And I don't know how to get over that to really appreciate this. And I said, I don't know if you ever 
get over it. I think we learned to hold both. We yeah. learned to have both. So the other day I was interviewing her. Uh, uh-huh. It was sort of part of my book launch. My virtual book launch was, right, right. was these different um, interviews that I did uh, mm-hmm. on video. And, and I said, do you remember that? And she said, not only do I remember that, I think of that every day. She said, that's equanimity, right? Yes, yes. You know, <laughs> so, so she was using that word. And, uh, you know, so I, I saw through the lives of a lot of people the living reality of the teachings, uh-huh. you know, having uh-huh. compassion and, and uh, uh-huh. having a sense of honoring one's innate dignity. The book almost starts with the story of this woman, Chantel, who's a, uh, one of the leaders of the striking fast food worker movement um, mm-hmm. in New York City, striking for $15 an hour minimum wage and the right to unionize. And, and I met a number of people, you know, in that community. And, uh-huh. and uh, they had often say, you know, first of all, they have nothing. They work very hard and, and they were often living like in homeless shelters because they couldn't afford any rent and things like that. And, but they'd often say, you know, my parents, even my family said to me, don't do anything that might rock the boat. You have almost nothing. You're going to have nothing if oh, you really? lose your job, you know, and just yes, like, yes. don't, don't make waves. And, yeah. And she said, basically, you come to a place where you realize inside you're worth something and you can't just like take it anymore. Uh-huh. And that sense of innate worth. And she said, and I look at these young, younger kids mm-hmm. and I think, what's there going to be for them? You know, she said, I don't do it just for me. I do it for them. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think, well, you couldn't get a more beautiful example of the teachings, you know, of like sure. the innate, the... yeah, the innate dignity of everybody, and everybody uh-huh. has worth, and mm-hmm. you know, we should respect one another in that light, and so on. So I really, I did learn a lot. That's really great, uh, Sharon. You know, even there are some people still in the Dharma world who are having this problem about. Should should we ever stop meditating and go out and do something? Would that be a disturbance to our meditation? In other words, you know, the idea of stay on the pillow or be an activist. You know, one either or. You know, and uh, and maybe some even some teachers are into that more. And you have been the one to unify both things and bring the one to the other and the one back to the other. So that that's really really something. You know, and, whoops! What happened? Oh, 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 oh. So, but, the, Did you lose the picture? That happens to me sometimes. For a second, for a second. I don't know. I was worried that they have a. But sometimes we have power outages in the mountains here, so that's why I went. Whoops! It was. It went dark. But it should be okay. So I was. I was wishing you would read. I. I really like this on on, on page one thirty four. Practice cultivating joy. Of course, that's my sort of my my trip. But I love the way you did it. You know, and I don't know if you if yeah. you want to lead us in that. If you want to read from that a little bit, if you if you would like sure. to. Sure. It's a, it's at it's at the end of it. Well, that whole chapter actually. That's why I got late. I guess got very absorbed in that chapter rereading it. I did read the whole thing when I did a did a blurb for the book because I really liked it. And there were so many things. That I always, of course, feel guilty being translating some book from the you know, from 2,500 years ago or even older or 700 years ago or something, you know, because I think it's important that people have that knowledge in the English language. And then I don't get out to meet these people. And then I got to say, eat the banana already. <laughs> and, 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 I mean, this chapter about finding a home, I think it was, it's called, it comes from the chapter of finding a home and the wake and joy is another part. And then this is the practice, or I don't know, maybe you'd rather another passage in this chapter. No. Uh, oh, coming, um, home, coming home to ourselves, you know, is the name of chapter five and the practice. Mm-hmm. So if maybe you'd like to take us through that. I think it's really Sure. Cool. And, um, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it follows, you know, uh, early, somewhat earlier chapters on channeling anger into courage and moving through grief to resilience and uh-huh. um, uh, then 
take in the joy in this too. You know, uh, it both came up in my discussion the other night with these people from Parkland and uh, it, it comes up a lot, you know, when you, you, I mean, so much of our culture here in the States tells us not to look at suffering, not to admit it, to feel yeah. ashamed of it if it's our denial. own, to hide it. Denial, it's denial, denial, yes. But the idea is not to open to suffering and crumble, you know, and just exactly. fall apart. We need some sense of inner resource. We need some ability to meet it uh, and have some equanimity, have some mm -hmm. compassion and so mm -hmm. on. And so mm -hmm. uh, part of that whole process is being able to take in the joy and uh -huh. you can feel so guilty and it's like wrong to somehow admit it. And that was the story about a, a friend of mine who wouldn't let himself eat a banana, you know, and he was also <laughs> very depressed. I think about it. Those were not totally unrelated things, yeah. you know, so. Uh, and and you, were implying, you were implying that when he, when he would take a banana and peel it, he would then think of all the farm workers who harvested the bananas who were suffering so badly yeah. in the feudal likes in Guatemala or wherever it was. Yeah, the yeah. thumb of the, the overseer and all that. And so then he couldn't eat the banana. You know, it suffered so much, but he, he didn't want to eat it because he would be guilty, you know. I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean he's, he's not wrong in his vision yeah. or wasn't wrong in his vision, but nonetheless you know uh there's a certain place in which you need to replenish you know exactly and you need to have some joy and otherwise you're not going to be able to be with the suffering and have any energy you know yeah. to try to do anything you're just going to collapse because it's hard it's very well, very hard yeah but also actually they did finally get the banana yeah harvested and it got to him a lot of people were abused along the way but at least they got him a banana yeah, and so somewhere in there, uh, enjoy it and be thankful. You know, that's another. Yeah, I mean, I was upstairs in this house reading the book for the audio version because uh, it wasn't a studio to go to, and uh, at some point I say, "Will you just eat the damn banana?" <laughs> Which I thought was a very funny line. <laughs> you know, just eat the damn it. banana. You know, already. Exactly. exactly. Uh, maybe you need the potassium. Maybe you cheer up. Maybe you could work harder. You know, if you weren't so. Because it is, it is a difficult balance for us because we do need to admit the suffering, which doesn't come readily for most of us because we're taught to avoid it and or be ashamed of it. And on the other side, uh, it's something that always intrigued me about the Buddhist teaching was that suffering is not the point, you know, like it, it's That's not right. redemptive in and of itself to be yeah. broken by suffering, to be embittered by suffering, to feel... Mm -hmm. It's only me, you know, to feel isolated by suffering. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the point. It's not what's going to free us. It's having a whole other relationship to the suffering and to joy uh -huh. as uh -huh. well. And so uh, what are the ingredients of that other relationship? It has to do, like for that woman, um, Chantelle, it has to do with self-respect in the best possible sense of understanding mm -hmm. our innate potential. Mm -hmm. It has to do with being able to take in the joy mm -hmm. and and be uh, kind of metaphorically fed by that, not just the banana, you know, mm -hmm. and and to, uh, to kind of see more deeply into the nature of things. So uh -huh. that's what um, this practice is, uh, is really based on that. So this is another another practice we can do together so the passage starts out with uh in order to have the resiliency to face difficulties for example a friend or client who can't be helped or a day full of sudden changes outside of our control we need to find and nurture the positive parts of ourselves and make a point of paying attention to experiences that give us pleasure mm -hmm. Too often we focus pretty much only on what's wrong with us or on negative, unpleasant experiences. Mm -hmm. We need to make a conscious effort to include the positive. This doesn't have to be a phony effort or one that denies real problems. Mm -hmm. We just want to pay attention to aspects of our day we usually overlook or ignore. Mm -hmm. If we stop to notice moments of pleasure, a flower poking up through the sidewalk, a puppy experiencing snow for the first time, a kind interchange between strangers. We have a resource for more joy. Mm -hmm. This capacity to notice the positive 
might be somewhat untrained, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. We practice meditation for just this kind of training. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what follows is a practice. And I just want to say uh, a little bit more about that before maybe we do that practice, if you like. So Good. Yes, please. Um, it's really, uh, you know, it feels like maybe it's the most selfish thing in the world. And, and yet it's really essential to be able to take in the joy. And mm -hmm. um, again, when I, I did this evening uh, the other night as part of the book launch with this community from uh, Parkland, one of the people on the panel was Fred Gutenberg, who's a very active gun safety person. His daughter mm -hmm. was killed in, in that school shooting. And he has a book coming out called Look for the Helpers, that famous Mr. Rogers quotation, you know, mm -hmm. when he was a young child, mm -hmm. very disturbed by the world. His mother told him, look for the helpers. There are people oh. here, you know, who oh. are helping. So, right. so, uh, I spoke to Fred before we did the panel and I told him I had retweeted his book announcement, his forthcoming book announcement. And that meant that my name and his name were briefly tied together on Twitter. So I got to see just the barest glimpse of the hatred and the oh. viciousness and the vileness coming his way. Really? So I said, how do you deal with it? And he said, first of all, the worst thing in the world happened to me on February 14th when my daughter was killed. So this is like nothing. And he said, I don't look at the hatred. I look at the love and the compassion that has come my way. Mm. And he said, and it's enormous. Mm. That's why he called his book, look for the helpers. Uh -huh. And I thought, wow, you know, if you can have that kind of, you know, tragedy and mm. make a point of looking for the helpers and mm -hmm. be buoyed up by that. You know, mm. that is a really essential lesson Absolutely. for all of us. You know, Absolutely. look for the helpers. And people oh. sometimes say to me, how do you, these days, you know, when everyone's going through a lot, and they say, how do you find resilience? Like, what keeps you going? And I say two things. One is the quotation from someone that's in the book where someone said that grief is love that doesn't have the ordinary place to land. <laughs> you know the person the situation uh -huh. the ideal whatever it's it's gone uh -huh. but the mm -hmm. love is still there sure and so looking at that love is part of it and part of it mm -hmm. um is being inspired being buoyed up by the people who are trying to do good in this mm -hmm. you know really difficult situation there's some mm -hmm. story uh in the news about a school in uh, Minnesota, I think it was, which was a place that was distributing food to hungry people in the community. And, uh -huh. and they put out a call for literally seven bags of food mm -hmm. so they could give it away. And they got 20,000. <laughs> you know, so I think of that and I think maybe we'll be okay, you know. <laughs> yes. Look at that, you know, there is wow. goodness, there is care in this mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why don't we do another meditation practice a little okay. bit. Okay. Uh, for yeah. this meditation, sit or lie down on the floor in a relaxed, comfortable mm -hmm. posture. Mm -hmm. Your eyes can be open or closed. Mm -hmm. Now bring to mind a pleasurable experience you had recently, one that carries a positive emotion, such as happiness, joy, comfort, contentment or gratitude <clears throat> maybe it was a wonderful meal or a reviving cup of coffee or time spent with your kids perhaps there's something in your life you feel especially grateful for a friend who's always there for you a pet excited to see you a gorgeous sunset a moment of quiet If you can't think of a positive experience, be aware of giving yourself the gift of time to do this practice now. Take a moment to cherish whatever image comes to mind with the recollection of the pleasurable experience.
See what it feels like to sit with this recollection. Where in your body do you feel sensations arising? What are they? How do they change? Focus your attention on the part of your body where those sensations are the strongest. Stay with the awareness of your bodily sensations and your relationship to them, opening up to them and accepting them. Now notice what emotions come up as you bring this experience to mind. You may feel moments of excitement, moments of hope, moments of fear, moments of wanting more. Just watch these emotions rise and pass away. All of these states are changing and shifting. Perhaps you feel some uneasiness about letting yourself feel too good because you fear bad luck might follow. Perhaps you feel some guilt about not deserving to feel this happiness. In such moments, practice inviting in the feelings of joy or delight and allowing yourself to make space for them. Acknowledge and fully experience such emotions. Notice what thoughts may be present as you bring to mind the positive. Do you have a sense of being less confined or less stuck in habits? Or perhaps you find yourself falling back into thoughts about what went wrong in your day, what disappointed you. These thoughts can be more comfortable because they're so familiar. If so, take note of this. Do you tell yourself, I don't deserve this pleasure till I give up my bad habits? Or I must find a way to make this last forever. Try to become aware of such add-on thoughts and see if you can let them go and simply be with the feeling of the moment.
end the meditation by simply sitting and being with the breath. Be with the breath gently as though you were cradling it. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. And then I close with, bring this skill of gentle interest, curiosity, and attention to your encounters throughout the day. Notice pleasurable or positive moments, even those that may seem small. <laughs> That's really great. I really, I really like it. Bring the skill of gentle interest, curiosity, and attention to your encounters throughout the day. That's really, really great. You know, what I love is, you know, the Buddhist teaching has the four immeasurables, right? Of love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. And so you, you have Im imbibed that pattern, of course, yourself so thoroughly in your practice. But what is unique about you is you bring it into sort of simple things in the daily lives of people who are, uh, they're, they're not involved in dharma practice and whatever, but they're just involved in good heartedness. And you provide a sort of a handle into those zones for those people without freighting it with a lot of dharma sort of thing, you know. And that is so helpful and so kind and so effective. It's really, really, really great. I really like it. Thank you. I want. To, I mean, there's of course a quote from you in the very early on in the book because the underlying theme, uh, in a way, is interconnection. Yes. And how one of the reasons something like loving kindness or compassion is actually a superpower. It's not a weakness or something saccharine yes. and gooey. Sure. Uh, is because it's closely aligned with the truth of how things actually are. So yeah. this is a shout out to Larry who wrote a, a, something in the chat. Um, hi. Oh, um, yeah. It's so good to see you here. And uh, I uh, somebody sent me a quote of me from like 10 years ago or something, which is always an interesting experience. And yeah. because something I, I have been saying all along is, uh, or since then anyway, is that uh, interconnection is the way things actually are. Right. And it doesn't take a spiritual understanding to come to that. Science shows us this. Economic shows us this. Environmental consciousness certainly shows us this. Even epidemiology mm -hmm. shows us this. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because of Larry and friends, I've been using the term epidemiology mm -hmm. all these years. And people used to say to me, what's that? You know, like, what does that mean? I don't know what that means. Uh, oh, oh, you mean Larry Brilliant? You mean, yeah. Yeah, right, right. You know, so here we are. <laughs> like, you know, uh, this is this is the truth of things. Look at this time that yeah. any illusion we had that what happens over there will nicely stay over there and what we do doesn't matter. Yeah. It's just dissolved. And so that's why loving kindness is so powerful. It's because it's the... Yeah most natural response to seeing mm -hmm. things as they actually are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Have you seen Larry on CNN? He's on a lot now. I, I see him. I follow him everywhere. <laughs> <Big dude. laughs> um, you know, and the quotation from you is one of my favorite things to quote, which I'm sure I use more often than you do, which is imagine... You're on a subway, oh, and right, right, right. these Martians come, and they <laughs> zap the subway car so that those of you who are in there are going to be together forever. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? If somebody's hungry, you feed them. If somebody's freaking out, you try to calm them down, not because you necessarily like them or approve of them, but because you're going to be together forever, because our lives are interlocked. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is so much the truth of how things are. Guess what? Mm -hmm. Our lives really are that way. And as mm -hmm. alone and isolated and mm -hmm. 
apart as we may feel, it's just not the truth of things. Mm -hmm. That we are really do live in an interdependent universe and everything follows from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lama Govinda tells a story about in some inter-religious conference, he was talking with someone who was sort of putting down uh, Theravada Buddhism by translating equanimity as uh, l'indifférence in French, indifference. You know, the opeksha, you know, opeka, you know. And they were, they were saying, well, you have love there, yes. And then compassion, and then joy, immeasurable joy, and then, and then indifference, and you don't care, ultimately. <laughs> And he was saying, he used to say how, how he, he corrected him in that conference by saying that uh, in, the, in, the, in the rising through the four stages, love, compassion, joy, and equanimity, that the next st each stage up carries the full energy of the stage below. So they're not, it's not at all indifference. Equanimity doesn't mean you're indifferent to anybody. It means you're totally loving, compassionate, and joyful about everybody. So sometimes I'm tempted, or in some context, one translates it as impartiality, you know, you know, equanimity, and because of the danger of people thinking that means you don't care about anybody because you're all it's all equanimous. You know? The adjective is 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 terrible. You know, equanimous <laughs> looks bad on the page. Equanimous, you know, <laughs> yeah. looks bad, but equanimity is okay. Anyway, I think that's really wonderful. And I was looking at that. I'm looking a lot at Abhidharma nowadays. And I was looking at the different factors of the different, um, the different immeasurables. And so the factors of the ones, you have a kind of joy and a kind of rapture and delight that lifts you into the first one and two. And these, these drop away in the upper ones, but that's because their goal has been reached and you have the love and the compassion and the joy, and it's all embedded in the state, so you don't need any more factor. You still only have the balancing, you add the balancing factors. And there wouldn't be that dropping away if, if in fact, you were, you were just leaving the whole lower state. No, but I, I, you don't see that uh, because they don't care, they're meditating and they're realizing that, so they don't emphasize that usually in the actual Abhidharma book. They don't. Well, you, I also quote you in that, uh, you're the you're the person when I say, even even scholars and translators, meaning you, uh, have come to me and said, "Well, you don't really need to say loving kindness. Stop being so cutesy. Just say love." Uh, oh, but I mean. like that you do. I, on the other hand, I, I I like that, and I and I right, I say where it comes from. I at least I I believe I know where it comes from, from the the reaction to missionaries, who came to bringing the Bible and saying love, 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 and then they did horrible things to them. So they wanted to add, like, the Asian people say, yeah, loving kindness, right? <laughs> they wanted that because they were treated cruelly, you know, uh, with, uh, with the waving uh, Jesus's, you know, uh, book, uh, the book, you know, the good book about love. So they, they, they just wanted to make sure kindness was in there. And I think that, therefore, it still has a role. I think it's still very good, I think. I mean, you can fuss about it in the, in the translating time, but in the long term, but in the short term, it's very, very useful to have there. And um, you know, that was the funny thing, you know, about Mary Trump's book. You know, I read the book. I don't know if you looked at it. Maybe you spared yourself that one. <laughs> but, but what's surprising about it is because she, she kind of wants to guard the world against this rather difficult bully uh, bully that she's experienced in a family, you know, and her father experienced rather badly. But actually, when she analyzes his upbringing and the whole thing, it ends up building great sympathy for him, you know, mm -hmm. because he was so, uh, he was so, you know, like, had such a harsh, it was such an abusive childhood, and to, and he was so neglected and uh, and and abusive in the sense of of um, absence of affection and the genuine, you know, what, what the psychologist calls the mother's, the uh, 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 more healthy mother's active 
you know, mirroring of positive emotions to the infant, you know, the two-year-old, the one-year-old, you know, and the cuddling and the hugging, you know, he was utterly deprived of that. And she, she, she analyzes that very well. And I think, I think somewhat unintentionally ends up where you feel even more sorry for the poor guy. Maybe everybody doesn't, but I did. I've always felt sorry for the guy, you know, and, and, and what a disservice to him you know, the Russians and the various people to put him in a position where a guy who has trouble caring for others because he feels so uncared for himself has to be in a position where the job day one is to care for everybody. You know, that's the service of uh, someone with that kind of responsibility, really. But people talk about power, but it's really what it is is responsibility. And when they can't, they can't even imagine what it is to take responsibility they're in a terrible situation it's really it's really a suffering actually i personally think and it's amazing he hasn't collapsed actually to me all this time he has you know eats bad food you know he has weird flattering weirdos around him who are exploiting the situation because of his craziness and he still gets he doesn't get enough feedback you know can't get enough affection from anybody it's really dreadful poor thing anyway so that's why i mean you're you're exhibiting kind of the fact that compassion doesn't have to be a weakness that it can be a strength which is a big mystery for people of course you know they, they there's a lot of fear i think that we're one to have a kind of empathy or compassion either one or both you know for somebody whose agenda you feel is incredibly damaging that you will stop fighting yes. yes you know that you will stop you'll just kind of give in because compassion yes. is is giving in but it's really not at all not at all not real compassion and uh, well that's another thing you you address the whole issue of empathy fatigue versus compassion fatigue i thought very well and uh, and very practically you know i i do tend a little to the bodhisattva thing of infinite empathy and infinite compassion you know which, which, of course, we normally are really not capable of. So what you are dealing with is dealing with the reality of the people, and that's good. But in a way, it's also not bad to have, an, to have that template, the ideal, somewhere lurking there. <laughs> you like the Dalai Lama, you know, I love what he says, you know, where the way he explains, you can, you can feel it when he explains it. When he's in that position where you, which you described so well, of where you feel all alone in some misery and something is really overwhelming you and nobody ever had it as bad as you had it and it's so awful what happened to a dear one or a near one or someone someone that you care about or even anyone and he says when he he gets that and then the way he helps himself he gets out of the being completely crushed by it by empathy is to open to more empathy and more compassion in the sense of thinking about what's happening to other people, sort of like people do for schadenfreude, of at least that's not happening to me, but he doesn't do it for schadenfreude, or in, uh, in a way, maybe it's a like a schadenfreude, but it's, a, it's a, for a positive purpose, and that is he sees there's so much suffering by broadening his openness that then he realizes, well, there's no, nothing for it but to gather positive energy, and what is that? And that's that's what you touch on in your practice, cultivating joy. You know, in a way, the, if if the gap between immeasurable compassion and equanimity, which has all compassion and love and joy, is to find the joy, it's like looking at the really sick or the suffering person and seeing something good in them, where they kind of have a little, maybe they're not showing it then because they're in agony, but there are things in them like where they see a flower or where they temporarily see some redeeming silver lining in some aspect of something. And so then the wish for their joy, them to, ha- to enjoy the joy that they actually have is what that, and for that becomes then a source of your measurable joy, which, which gives you the energy to cope with what you discover through compassion. Mm-hmm. Without the joy, without some power of, the joy is the most powerful. And so, because that's what reality is, you know, is, is, is a kind of uh, joy, maybe, you know, Buddha says so anyway. <laughs> that's what he says. Oh, that's so great. Wonderful. So, 
So um, isn't it fun that you can meet all these people? You're in Parkland. And where else are you going on your trip? Where, where else can we find you online? Well, I'm not going anywhere, literally. I'm no, I know, but I'm saying, no, I mean, yeah. your virtual yeah. trip. My virtual trip, yeah. yeah. What other things are coming up? Where else are you going? Are you going to go to the West Coast? Are you are going to be yeah. invited by, <laughs> for, for, a, for a podcast with, um, with um, what, uh, Buddha Fest? Or are you going to be present in that? You were, you were in uh, Ojai. Uh, well, you and I were just in, yeah, in Maui together. Because yeah, well, we did, did someone said we weren't anywhere. Some <laughs> someone to say there were ten thousand people online for yeah. that event. So the, uh, you met ten thousand people and you talked to them, and you shared with them. And I hope that they heard. About, I'm, I'm sure they heard about your book. I hope so. So there, you know, what I'm saying, it's wonderful that you can do what you have tirelessly. And everyone is always like, Sharon, how can she do it? And go everywhere, seeing everyone going, going everywhere where people are suffering, where people are where need encouragement. And Sharon is there, you know. You're like, you've, you've been like, you know, you've been like that bunny in the ad for the battery. You know, the, <laughs> the energizer bunny. You've been the That's why I talk bunny. about rest all the time. Cause I'm like, That's right. And, <laughs> and, and now you can do that. Yeah. The point is now you're home in peaceful yeah. setting, yeah. Yeah. just across the building from Joseph's like porch. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then and then you can still go there. Yeah. And meet the people in Hawaii or overseas. Yeah. yeah. Without having to get on the plane and listen to the person angrily shutting up somebody else's plane. And all of the things that we have from yeah. your different anecdotes. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's wonderful, really. I'm no, so happy, happy for you. Thank you. Well, I do have a lot of events. <laughs> I'm all doing them all from here. And uh, it's just on my website, SharonSalzberg.com. So, yes, oh, okay. this very week I'm, like, going, to, so to speak, to Cambridge and to Berkeley. And to, oh, wonderful. You know, it's all over the place. And, and That's so really great. my uh, intention, my hope, is to work really, really hard until the election. Yeah. And, you know, because part of uh, what I'm – trying to do is encourage people to vote and and sort yes. of make sure that happens and then i'll take a break after the election yes yes well it might be there the, the, take might take the election a little while to end well that is true <laughs> because of this <laughs> well, of the civil war that they're trying to the, the, the potential loser is trying to conjure up but did, did i tell you what my psychic told me a year or two ago ago did i ever tell you that no. i can share it with you because i think <laughs> They might, if you knew that person, they might have told you the same thing. Well, they told me before I knew about this coming election, and of course, I already knew how bad things were getting a year or so ago, and I was feeling hyper about that, you know, and uh, I was sort of kind of retiring, but I didn't look forward to any peace. But anyway, this uh, this this lady, Mary, I don't know if you ever met Mary Murin at Menla or something. Wonderful lady, but she's a, she's also a psychic. She channels somebody from somewhere. I don't know exactly who, you know. But they they also often have had good advice in my own experience. So they she she called me aside at some point, and she said, "Oh, oh my people have something to tell you." Uh, oh, really? I, it was the first time she'd ever done it. And I and, and I said, "Well, oh, fine. Well, what, what is it?" Oh, well, come sit down. So, so then I go and sit down in the little chapel at Tibet House. This was in the city, and. Uh, she says, well, what they do is the first thing they want me to tell you is that in 2021, you're going to be really happy, they say. <laughs> so I, being very suspicious of happiness, like everybody is in our culture, I say, well, what do you mean? You mean they, they want me to know that I'll be dead at 80? <laughs> That's my 80th year in the Western way of counting. She says, oh, no, 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 you'll be fine, you'll be fine. She said, she said, it's just the reason you'll be so happy is that the world will be back on a good track, going in a good direction. She said, really strongly. So I'm so thrilled to hear that. I was, every bone in my body, you know, because I a little bit respect what, whatever they sell her, that particular person. I say, oh, that's great. And then... <laughs> 
And then, I, okay, that's fine. I'm about to leave that city. But then she said, well, but they, they have a, they're telling you this for a reason. I said, well, what's that? And she said, well, until then, forget about it. You're going to be busy every second, no matter what you do. <laughs> You're going to feel like the lady who was rushing to get to a yoga place to relax. You're going to be like out there, you know, and of course nobody had any idea of COVID at that time or like, you know, the, 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 the Tibet House nonprofit collapsing because of not being able to have assemblies, you know, and not having people coming and, and you have no income and have to fire all the people maybe, but maybe getting a little help from Nancy Pelosi, certainly not from Mitch McConnell and from the, the creepy president in the White House and so on. And so, you know, we're really looking at a difficult thing and our friends have rallied and I think we'll make it. But it's really, if it, if it goes on much longer, we would not actually, certainly. But, um, and I hear, so Bauer is also shut down. That's, uh, mm -hmm. that's, uh, yeah, but we are a little bit able to open because of Cuomo having done the right thing here in New York. And he's allowed, you can have capacity with all stringent controls and special personnel out there sweeping and spraying and washing and, face, you know, masking and the whole scene, you know, and, and eating individually and, you know, no group uh, eating and all this kind of thing. So, so we're able to a little trickle coming that way, and then online work and all this. You know, so as you know, we've been working hard at that, and for sure, I've been. And, and not only that, it's in the political thing. Then you get all these things: give twenty bucks to defeat Mitch McConnell. Oh, to get Arizona away from this. You know, another thirty bucks here and ten bucks there. And I can't afford all that. But what I always do is I try to give even three bucks, and I visualize. That when I am taking the decision, okay, to fill in the card and do the whole thing for three bucks or 10 bucks or 20 bucks, I visualize the vibe is going out and one million people are going to give three bucks. So it's going to be three million. You know, which I, who knows? You know, it's a fantasy. But I, I try to do that. Like Samantha Badra, you know, flower ornament sutra style, you know. And I hope it happens. You know, I don't know. I have no idea. But, you know, there's a sense of stress of get the people to the polls, get the people out to vote, you know, get out the Buddhist vote off the meditation cushion and get out and vote and get other people to vote and so forth. Like, like my favorite is a lady who worked for a Wells, for one of the big banks in San Francisco and retired originally from Ohio. And she told me at the 2018 time that, that uh, at that election, she voted in San Francisco but by absentee, and then mailed it in, and then the head of the election drove, or flew, I guess. She didn't say she drove, but she flew to, back to Ohio and got a car and uh, drove the old people to the polls. A banker, this like a lady, you know, not a, you know, uh, you know, who could have just gone to the Hawaii or something, you know. But instead, she went and drove people to the polls in Ohio, where her home state, you know, where her vote you know, couldn't cast because she's in California. And that, that I admire that. I haven't reached that. I don't have, I haven't, well, I am from New York anyway, so. But uh, I don't have a home state, you know. And, uh, and uh, I should do something. I try to do what I can of that type, but I, I fall short for sure. And I try not to be guilty. I, I read Be the Change. Be the Change. Real change. Real change. I like this real series. You know, it's funny. Well, that, I mean, how this, about next book, Real Reality? <laughs> well, somebody. Well, this title was honestly a joke because we didn't know no, what else I to call it, it. Great. and uh, it stuck. So someone said, "How about real life for the next one?" So that's close to real yeah. reality. Yeah, that is real life would be good if you if you want to stick with the real thing. Stick with the real thing. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to conceptualize another book. Are you working you on a book right now? Oh yeah, you know. Well, um, my everything. I I am uh, my own popular writing is stuck in a certain way. I don't know why. It's my own weird fault, karma. And um, well, I have a book in the press, you know, but it's not going out just yet. Trying to be whatever. But um, uh, the. Um, uh, I'm editing like three or four huge uh, things, you know, that that I worked on with others translating, and I'm doing the final editing. I mean, huge. I mean, 700 page, 
from Sanskrit and Tibetan and et cetera, et cetera, but all having to do, the whole topic is, of course, how to generate the inner joy that wells up from within the subtle nervous system, you know, tantra, area of tantra, within the subtle nervous system so as to have the energy to cope with the, with the world, you know, like the siddhas did, which I'm not a siddha, so I can't really do, but maybe someone will read it and be able to do it in the future is the reason to bring this knowledge out of Tibetan and Sanskrit into the modern world. And, you know, I've discovered what, I would, what I've come to call tantric abhidharma, which is a huge body of literature, actually. But they just don't call it Abhidharma in respect for the old individual vehicle, what I call, like to call the individual vehicle, you know, the foundation vehicle, to call it uh, the... So that's the Abhidhamma, right, you know? And there was one or two Mahayana Abhidhamma books that they used there. But even Nagarjuna's book is not called Abhidhamma. But it is, of course, Abhidhamma. You know, the, all the great masters and writers. Shantideva, that's Abhidhamma, really. And, but they don't use the term. And even no one would ever think to use the term tantric abhidharma. But uh, I, was, I, I was telling students today in my class that I'm doing kind of teacher training thing that I've decided the Tibetans' uh, understanding of the, the three vehicles, you know, the foundation vehicle, the universal, be, you know, the messianic vehicle, you could say, and then the esoteric Vajrayana vehicle. They talk about the coordination of the three vehicles. And what they mean is it's all fulfilled in the final highest Vajrayana. <laughs> but I, I got into t- terrible arguments with some of them by saying you're wrong. Because then do if you say that, you're accusing Buddha of not having shared the knowledge of Tantrayana even, even in the, in the foundation vehicle. But maybe not pushing it on people. So it's kind of hinted there in a certain way. And uh, so what I'm saying is, you know, the, you know in the... The creation stage, you know, is before the like high final stage or perfection stage, which I'm translating nowadays. But uh, but I'm saying that if, from tantric point of view, the Theravada is creation stage practice. It's creation stage, you know. And I and I it's very I can put it to very clear. This is just for fun. I we more or less finished. Everybody's fine and they're all happy. And then, and this is, but I'm, I'm happy to share this with you. Like the five aggregates, right? The Panjaskanda, you know? And if, if someone hasn't identified inside themselves the aggregate of feelings and of creation, mental functions and of conceptualizations and of matter and then consciousness and then all the elaborateness within consciousness, if they haven't identified these things internally, then they go and say they're all deities. What does that mean? They don't even know what they are. You know, how can, who can differentiate really between conceptualization and Vedana, which I still want to translate as sensations rather than feelings, because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. feelings being emotions, you know, in English. But, but they can't really tell the difference. So then what, what goes on to say one is Radha Sambhava and one is uh, Amitabha? Like, what is that? It means nothing. So to really learn about yourself, that's the foundational thing. And if you haven't learned mm-hmm. what the content of your mind is with these brilliant, marvelous, amazing things and, and the visualizations like of the Kisnayatana, I don't know, Pali, Kisnayatana, you know, where you see everything as earth or everything as mm-hmm. skeletons or everything as water, you know, which are like visualizations actually, really, in Theravada. They have everything. And they're le- developing the tremendous samadhi power and concentration and everything, right? So then you, without that, you pretend that you're doing some magnificent, uh, unbelievable thing. It's just kidding yourself. Which Dalai Lama always tells them, you know? He does, you know that? When he gives initiation, and he, sa- and he finishes the preliminary, and they're then patiently waiting for it to be over so they can get to the initiation. <laughs> and he gets there and says, well, we're going to do the initiation now. That's a good omen. But you know, you guys are not ready to use it. I'm not really qualified to give it, but we do it as a good omen. But it, also we do it because I trick you. <laughs> because what I just did as a preliminary and you're impatient for me to get over with it, that's what's really helpful to you. 
It's so great. You know, Bob, I think there's a question that somebody Oh, I'm has, sorry. Oh, yeah, question to you. No, no, I, should, has been, uh, I thought we were... I'm sorry. I didn't mean to change the subject. No, no, no. I, I was, think that's... I was only it's so interesting. We, were more we should over. Zoom together sometime, you and I. We, we, we will. We will. Okay. Activism. What's the question? Who, who's going to... Uh, Michelle, Michelle, are you going to... Are you going to read it? I am. So, hey, Michelle. Oh, there's Michelle. How nice. Right. Hello. We'll see you. Thank you both. I, you haven't even needed any moderation because you're just so awesome. <laughs> so oh, anyway, thank you. Thank I'll read this question. Uh, okay. It says, act, this is from an anonymous, but activism from a certain point of view seems it could be in opposition to impermanence. Activism certainly has the goal to reduce suffering. What role does the remembrance or awareness of impermanence play, if that is a pertinent question in relation to activism. Oh, hey, there's something for Sharon. Okay, well, I would say, uh, gee, I would say, how about Bob? Um, you know, I think uh, the realization of impermanence is an essential realization, and it also uh, is concurrent with realizations about conditionality and interconnection and you know so impermanence doesn't mean there's no cause and effect there's everything is just kind of haphazard uh and i think we can easily take it to mean that you know but um there is in fact kind of cause and effect there's conditionality there's relationship there's relatedness in this universe and so uh if i do nothing to try to make a difference that registers as nothing <laughs> you know rather than a seed that gets planted that may go through various iterations and obstacles and you know alterations and and whatever but is actually a seed planted and so i think it's there's so much that a uh, kind of um awakened mind might be holding or or referencing in in activism impermanence is one uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and part of that is that things aren't necessarily going to change on our timetable you know that i mean several people have said things to me lately about um and I, this is also in my book that some things are not a one generation fix mm -hmm. you know that uh uh friend of mine who's uh, maybe my oldest friend, you know, who would say, um, it may not be in my lifetime that I see the, the result of this, but nonetheless, it's essential that I do whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, and many people have, have said to me that they've learned to refer to their sense of purpose and, and the fulfillment of that sense of purpose rather than the result. Cause sometimes you don't get to see the result or you don't get to see it right away. And so mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, it's a mix of impermanence and conditionality and recognizing that our acts are still powerful. They're still impactful, mm -hmm. even when we don't have mm -hmm. that great, mm -hmm. wonderful satisfaction of seeing it make a difference right away. Right. Sharon, do you That's, want me to say something too? Yeah, about that? please do. So, because I, I, I think it will come back to the same thing. What I want to say is that actually activism comes, real activism, effective, comes from in, knowledge of impermanence. In the Abhidharma, uh, compassion can only, has to always be, which is kind of a, a feeling, like emotional commitment to finding, based on empathy, of finding the unbearability of someone else's suffering, or compassion for yourself, is recognizing that you should try to get rid of your suffering and trying to give yourself a break. So, which Sharon is very good on that one. So, so without the wisdom of, compa of every impermanence, according to the Abhidhamma, then there can be no valid compassion, because although there can be sympathy, the, the condition of the suffering person seems to be unchangeable to the person and then they wouldn't have activism so therefore what 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 uh, what compat what uh, what what, it, what knowledge of impermanence makes you realize that this person is now suffering but they can change so then you want to make them have real change and that means you are an activist to imp to help cause that change whether you you succeed or not 
you feel compelled to do it, and you have a power because you can visualize them in a free state from this chain, from their suffering. If you, without the knowledge of impermanence, you kind of think everything the way it appears to you immediately is just the way it always going to be. So you feel stuck and incapable of doing anything, and then no compassion will arise in you. And the sympathy will be almost a kind of ratifying the other person, you know, patronizing, ratifying the other person in that bad state that they can't be changed. Nothing I can do about it. So you feel powerless. And that's not compassion. Compassion is power. And so compassion is making change into real change. <laughs> nice. Thank you. <laughs> but there's something else there, Michelle? Michelle? Yeah, there's, there are, um, okay, so this, I'll, I'm going to give a little bit more, let's see, Dale McGrath, do you think we can heal the polarization that is happening now in families and among friends? How can one deal with family members who are negative other than avoiding them? Uh, negative family members. <laughs> Well, I, I'm, I want to say that avoiding them is not always a bad thing, you know, uh, but in the sense that I think uh, the internal process of not bearing resentment and um, having loving kindness and compassion is is a process of our own freedom. Wisdom or discernment may tell us that it's not wise to be around somebody for a certain length of time or it's not safe or whatever. And, you know, there's such a thing as fierce compassion. And uh, Bob and I have taught, you know, several weekends together at Menla on fierce compassion. That's right. Just like there's such a thing as tough love. So the manifestation, uh, the particular um, thing we say or do or refrain from saying or doing is also fed by wisdom or discernment or understanding. So just don't limit yourself to feeling that, Mm -hmm. it's got to be that I, you know, act in a certain prescribed conventional way. But what's really so important is what's happening in one's heart and a sense of inclusion rather than exclusion and so on. And I guess I do believe we can heal the polarization, but in all honesty, the main thrust of my energy or my dedication um, is, is more toward trying to make sure everybody votes <laughs> you know, and and that people are engaged because it's one thing to heal polarization and it's another thing to uh, not do everything one can to see that policies enacted, for example, sort of take care of people. I and mean, look what's happening, you know, and, and uh, you know, I think we we have a responsibility if we are American citizens, if we have the ability to vote, um, to actually do that. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what happens in terms of reconciliation or, or the end of polarization, I think is there's going to be a time for that, but it, it's going to be a different time, you know, <laughs> uh, because I think it's just so essential. You can have enormous compassion for somebody and decide, you know what, I don't want you legislating <laughs> choices for me you know exactly like with your particular value system or whatever exactly i appreciate that so much and i, I mean maybe to close this because we're a minute after nine there's a there's kind of a sweet one what is your favorite tool in the words of bob dylan regarding don't look back to stay present what's your favorite tool to stay present oh <laughs> i thought back. you meant from the song i thought i don't know <laughs> yeah. I have to like <laughs> They're using the quote from Dylan, don't look back. Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, just take a breath. Just breathe. Ah, that's awesome. good. Awesome. Thank you both so that's much. Good. And, and be, on behalf of everyone that's here online with you, yes, actually, we appreciate yes, so much. I, I, I want to thank everyone, and I want to thank Michelle. Michelle, uh, Sharon, is teaching the yoga part of this Vajra Yoga teacher training thing that I'm embarking on with her. And her, with her having organized very really brilliantly and beautifully as well. And also with Mike Burbank helping and so forth and Justin. So I want to thank Justin as engineer and Michelle as moder moderator. And I, we didn't, I'm sorry, we didn't resort to you enough. But I know, you know, everybody is around here is a Leo. But Michelle and I are both Leos and I know we more or less can get it done. 
So, so, and Sharon, I just reminding me talking with you how much I do enjoy teaching with you, and I hope we soon get a chance, you know. And, uh, and, and uh, I was just going to make a daring suggestion, given yes. how busy we all are. Maybe yes. you and I could do another evening, just Q and A together. Yeah, sure, sure. Let's let's do that. You know, let's, let's set that up. We're, we're, given that we're like ah, busy, but yes, still, yes. it's no, so no, great no. being with you. It is really fun, Sharon. I really love it, and I love the book, and I wish it well. And I wish a lot of real change happens. And the big real change we have is Joe Biden and Kamala Harris taking over and a, de a Democratic majority in the Senate and the House. So we can finally pass these things that have been stalled since 2008, actually, by McConnell, the Koch brothers, the dark money, and fix Citizens United and fix this and that, and uh, bring Hillary back on a pillow. Uh, you know, who should have been our mom, our first mom president, but never mind. She's not going to, she's beyond that now, and she's happy. She's been happy these years with her grandchildren. Actually, it was almost a blessing for her. Actually, I knew an astrologer, Hindu astrologer, who said before the 2016 mm -hmm. election, to my shock, or actually right after the Democratic Convention, when things looked good, that she would go to lose and that he would win. To the, which were, I, it was against the whole thing, but the star, you know, they had their own way of reading the planets and the whole thing, these people. And they, but then they said they're all very puzzled, these Vedic astrologers, because from January on, the guy who won was going to be in a nightmare endlessly, whereas the lady who lost, which had a, who had a very bad configuration in November of 2016, from, from January 2017 on, she would be exalted and having an awesome time herself, released from this, this determination that she had to serve the world in this way, that she was so well prepared to do and so determined to do, but by actually getting away from the excessive stress of that terrible job, she was enjoying grandchildren and family and quality and being cheerful and relaxed, which is actually, you know, you, get, you should enjoy that in a certain stage of life. So I tell myself, approaching my eighth decade. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's the real change that we need, that I need. I'm sure Sharon does too. I'm sure we all do. And even the guys, all of them, McConnell, all the people, you know, when people endlessly, don't be embarrassed about fierce compassion, the lady who asked, the guy who asked about polarity. Don't be embarrassed about fierce compassion, even with Uncle Joe, you know, who wants to make something great again. Don't worry about it. You know, the point is that the, the more they, if they stay in power when they're in that confused state and harm other people like they're doing, this becomes more and more awful for them. And of course, it harms the people. So preventing them from harming others and thereby themselves is actually compassion for them. That's what fierce compassion is about. And they actually subliminally, they sense the difference. So when you tell Uncle Joe to just shut up and eat the turkey and don't like promote whatever it is to his grandchildren, to your grandchildren or your children, then you're being kind to him because in fact, he should enjoy his Thanksgiving dinner and not spout a bunch of kook kooky ideas, you know, that just make everybody else unhappy at the table. You know, and then then later he might look at polarization remediation. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody, and thank you especially Sharon oh, and thank all my you. all my love and a big air hug, air hug to you. Okay. All right. Big air hug, air hug, air. Lots hug. of love. This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. Menla membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit our websites at tibethouse.us or menla.org.